Thank you very much. Am I on? Am I on? Okay. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Thanks to Bill. T uh, Bill's a hard act to follow, so you'll have to bear with me as I go through my <clears throat> my consciousness raising uh, uh, remarks for today. Um, I've been coming to these uh, gatherings now for many years, and I don't think I've seen a crowd this big, which is um, which is uh, huge. Uh, we, we need <coughs> producers banding together in pro-competitive uh, ways to promote competition and uh, to become uh, more active and advocate for strong antitrust enforcement and good regulation, pro-competitive regulation. So um, what I'd like to do today is give you sort of the view from um, the antitrust community's perspective. Um, all my career, I've kind of walked the lines between antitrust and regulation. As you know, in your industry, that's, that's, a, big, um, that's a big crossover. And a lot of shared issues uh, on the regulatory side and also on the antitrust side. Um, but what we're seeing in Washington, D.C. and uh, with the state AGs, we do a lot of work with federal and state enforcers and regulators, um, is, uh, is not so good. And uh, I don't want to give a depressing talk but what I do want to do is provide some perspective that will help you uh, develop a better advocacy agenda, which um, helps us better advocate for uh, producers, particularly independent producers, and for smaller businesses and innovators and entrepreneurial um, participants in the market, and also importantly for consumers. So I want to talk about three things in my time. Uh, why we need to continue to beat the drum on high concentration in beef packing. Um, it's an old story. It's a current story. It's not going away. And there are things that we can do better to uh, raise awareness about the, uh, the uh, harm of high concentration. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why uh, proving price fixing is really, really hard. It's an uphill battle. All of you or some, many of you have been involved in price fixing cases, not only under uh, the, Packards, um, the Packers and Stockyards Act, but also in antitrust cases, private, um, private cases. We've had some public enforcement as well. And I um, want to kind of give you an update on where we are on price fixing. And then I want to talk about why we should be really, really concerned about the effects of foreign ownership. Uh, deals like Syngenta, ChemChina, uh, Smithfield uh, being taken over by the Chinese uh, pork company and other types of transactions. So three things that we'll get through. So let's, let's uh, tell the story we all know about high concentration and beef packing. Um, you know, this is the top four, for, four firm ratio. Uh, it's not uh, an HHI statistic, uh, as some of you know, which is a different measure of concentration, which looks at, at all market participants. The top, form, uh, top four ratio has gone up, up, up <clears throat> over, um, a, over you know, a long period of time from 1970. It's hovering just north of 80% at this point. Um, and what that tells you, of course, is that four firms control in packing, control 80% of the market. That's not many packers, not a whole lot of competition in a market like that. And I think everyone has felt the effects of that. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, top four packers control north of 80%. For those of you familiar with uh, concentration statistics like the HHI, that's around a 2,000 HHI, which is a moderately concentrated market. Um, any merger, I know this sounds incredible, but incredible stuff happens in antitrust. And any merger amongst the four packers would raise very serious competitive concerns very serious competitive concerns. An enormous increase in concentration as a result of that merger. And I went through all the possible scenarios when I was preparing my slides, right? <coughs> the most recent one, of course, 2009 JBS National Beef that was blocked by the US Department of Justice. And those are the smallest players at that point in the market. So any further consolidation in the top four would really generate very serious competitive concerns. And you know, you may think that's that's a long shot. I don't think it's a long shot at all. So what's the latest uh, three, four to three merger we've seen proposed recently? Sprint, T-Mobile, right? We thought we were good to go with four wireless producers, uh, wireless companies in the US. And sure enough, Sprint and T-Mobile are proposing to merge. That would take us down to three 
uh, uh, three players in that um, industry. We're almost down to three in um, agricultural biotechnology. Monsanto, Bayer, Dow DuPont now have merged. Uh, and we've got uh, Syngenta taken over by ChemChina and BASF as a small player on the fringe. So these four to three mergers are happening. And the question is whether enforcers are going to do anything, um, anything about them. So further consolidation four to threes would be really, really harmful, not only to producers but to consumers. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, vertical integration by packers into cattle supply exacerbates all these competitive concerns because they have, by owning livestock and owning, um, um, uh, owning packing interests, they have uh, enhanced incentives to foreclose smaller independent producers, and I'm sure um, many of you have experienced that. All right, so li but let's go back to the four to three merger problem because y you know it, I, I think it's, it's a possibility. So four to three mergers are really unique in that they increase the probability of collusion as opposed to creating a big dominant firm that can just throw their market power around. So they create much, much uh, enhanced opportunities for firms to, to just be at peace with their neighbors and not compete hard with one another. So we worry about them for that particular reason. Um, antitrust enforcers have consistently challenged four to threes. So uh, AT&T, T-Mobile, I just told you about that. That was abandoned in the face of government opposition. Uh, Acorn High Tech Pharmacol was a generic drug merger that was uh, that was challenged by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, but they they took a remedy, a divestiture. Uh, that was in 2014, and you all know JBS National Beef 2009. That was a full block on that merger. That did not go anywhere uh, for a very good reason. So economists have done a lot of really good empirical work, um, quantitative analysis on highly concentrative mergers. You know, mergers that create uh, dominant firms or oligopolies and um, really raise the risks of coordinated or collusive behavior. And what we're seeing now is a whole bunch of retrospective studies on consummated mergers. So economists are, are actually doing something useful now and they're, they're, they're going back and they're collecting data, price data on these mergers. And gosh, uh, you know, shockingly, as it turns out, you know, most consummated mergers that were highly concentrative actually resulted in price increases, right? And, and these, are, you know, these are seller market power mergers. You guys are on the other side of the market power equation. You know, you're, the su you're the subjects of, of monopsony power or buyer market power. But we do have a lot of work, work now out there that really, really reinforces and solidifies what organizations like mine have been really broadca broadcasting for, for 20 years, which is these highly concentrative mergers are bad. They're bad for producers, they're bad for competition, and they're bad for consumers, all right? Uh, and to boot, if, uh, uh, you know, if you look more at these, at these studies and this economic analysis, um, there really is a hard line. When you're down to three competitors, um, we're really looking at much higher levels of enforcement. So antitrust enforcers know what's going on here. They know these things are bad for, for competition, producers, and consumers. We just need to get them to be more consistent in blocking them. All right, so <clears throat> then I went back to prepare for my remarks today and, and sort of broke down you know, all, of, all of what we've um, read about on the economic side, on the policy side, on the law enforcement side, uh, on um, concentration in, in beef packing. So <clears throat> back in the 1970s, there was this whole series of studies that came out and you know there was really hard evidence that concentrated uh, concentration in beef packing was was harmful. It was just harmful. There was clear evidence, and there were warnings even back then, in the 1980s and the 1990s about high concentration in beef packing. So uh, they actually showed that higher market concentration results in lower prices for fed cattle, right? And it hurts. It hurts producers. Um, it was shown that packers exercise market power. Um, uh, at the national level, right? But there were also much greater concerns at the regional level. Well, you see that in regional markets, right? And that's what, that's what we care about, these smaller regional geographic markets. Not only that, but these early studies, I mean, we're going way back here, um, showed there were periods of what looked like collusive pricing, 
right? Where the, there would be collusion for a couple, three years, high prices, and then the, the agreement would break down and we'd see a dip in the prices and then there would be, uh, you know, there would be a regrouping of, of uh, the packers to maintain higher prices. And that's often what you see in, co in collusive pricing. Over time, we see prices go up where they're, they've reached and maintain the agreement, prices go down when the agreement falls apart and then it goes back up and down. And we have, in, in many different industries have long-term series of prices that show this kind of, this kind of behavior. All right, big shift, big shift, coming into the 80s and the 90s, suddenly efficiencies were really important, right? And gosh, high concentration, anti-competitive behavior was excusable because of some efficiencies argument or some justification for why high prices only, re only reflected legitimate business practices, right? And you've, again, you've all heard these arguments. So, <clears throat> We actually heard the argument that high concentration in packing is good because it produces, it's overwhelmed. Uh, it overwhelms the market power effects, right? So economies of scale in packing operations, the ability of packers to, um, to um, lower transactions costs, all of these kinds of arguments for why high concentration generated more benefits than it did costs, all right? And so, um, you know, we saw some specific studies around geographic markets. For example, in uh, Texas, in the Texas cattle auctions, uh, there was actual evidence of abuse, markdowns, uh, the exercise of buyer market power or monopsony power uh, in these markets, all right? But there was a warning, even with all of this, this sort of bowing down to efficiencies and justifications for high concentration, there were warnings that at some point the balances were gonna tip uh, more towards the market power side if there, were for, if there was further consolidation. So 1970s, lots of hand-waving, lots of concern. Should have paid more attention back then. 1980s and 1990s, you know, antitrust was captured by conservative, conservative economics and we ended up uh, giving a lot of deference to efficiencies. And here we are now, where in the 2000s and 2010s, where we've seen suspicious price volatility, uh, you know, Bill can tell you about that, obviously. And there is evidence of abusive behavior and abusive conduct in regional markets, all right? So you know all about the price volatility problems that we've seen in 2013 and the decrease in 2015 and 16. Um, uh, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, and uh, others concluded that supply and demand were primarily responsible. There was drought, there were feed costs, there were, you know, substitute pr prices of substitute proteins on the demand side, consumer preferences for certain types of protein. All of these arguments basically boils down to, well, it's not market power, it's just the market. And it's supply and demand and it's market dynamics that are accounting for this. Uh, and it's, it's really time, given high concentration, given the abuses that have been proven out there, for people to stop accepting those arguments that it's all about efficiencies and it's okay. It doesn't excuse that type of abusive market power, exercise of market power. So on balance, we went from the 70s to being concerned and lots of evidence to the 80s and the 90s where there was vir virtually no antitrust enforcement because we were the, the conserv conservative thinkers in antitrust were giving a lot of deference to uh, efficiencies. And now we're back to having some hard evidence that maybe there's a serious problem here. All right, so let's recap. <laughs> recap, early signs of concentration largely ignored, right, back in the 70s. Uh, there's been no responsive or coherent policy, competition policy in the face of growing, uh, growing concentration and hard evidence of abusive practices. Uh, 20 plus years of deference to efficiency justifications for concentration, despite the fact that none of these justifications really hold any water anymore. There are no more economies of scale to be reaped in, uh, in packing, the packers are as big as they're gonna get and they're not gonna lower their costs any more than they already have, right? Um, we've got growing, growing complexity in pricing. You guys deal with this all the time, different pricing methods, negotiated versus formula pricing, complexity in contract, pr contracting, there's industry integration. These are all factors that complicate the competition picture and the ability of enforcement to get at these kinds of problems. And you know, frankly, USDA kind of dropped the ball. 
on a lot of the price reporting stuff. They didn't really think it through very well. They don't do good price reporting. They don't do analysis of transactions. And um, there are some distinct downsides to having very transparent price reporting in, in that if you have all these prices floating around, uh, it can actually uh, facilitate collusion amongst, uh, amongst the packers. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about price fixing in more detail. Seen this graph, right? With the big dip in 20, uh, uh, 2015 and 2016. This is buyer market power. So this is depressing prices for fed cattle paid to, paid to producers. Um, but it, this is not an unusual sort of um, profile of prices over time. So I want to show you some others. <laughs> so I did, a, I did a paper with Bob Taylor down at Auburn, one of the finest agricultural economists ever. And we were looking at the fertilizer cartel. There's a global fertilizer cartel for potash and nitrogen and phosphorus. And we saw a huge price spike down there around 2008, 2009. So this is seller market power. Prices went up as a result of cartel behavior went up to US farmers. So it's the same kind of thing. I mean, they're almost identical, right? You've got, um, you've got that on the, on the seller side. You've got the spike or the drop, right, on the seller side. Here you've got a price spike. And even, even better <laughs> in pork. In the recently filed litigation in AgriStats for the pork integrators, where they're trying to make a case for, um, for collusion, you saw a price spike as well. So these are the kind of things that we look at. These should be suspicious price spikes and price drops if you're on the buying side of the market, right? And this got a lot of attention. So what are the challenges of price fixing? And, and so many of you know this already. It, evidence is key. Evidence is, is key. Unfortunately, in the United States, it is not illegal to tacitly collude. So to, to have a serious, legitimate collusion case, you really have to have the smoking gun evidence. You have to have the tapes. You have to have the videos. You have to have the emails between the CEOs that where, where they agreed to, uh, to fix prices and maintain them or to restrict output. And, um, and it proves that they, uh, that they were engaged in an active conspiracy, right? Tacit collusion is different. You don't need an actual agreement where you met in a smoke-filled room like they did in the informant in the Lysine case. Um, but you can have any number of variables in place or factors in place that actually create conditions where producers are going to follow each other. They're going to be at peace with each other. They're, they know it's in their mutual interest to keep prices low in the case of fed cattle or high in the case of monopoly or oligopoly power. But for the courts, it's a really, really hard distinction. And, and even more depressingly, it, we've had bad law on price fixing as recently as last year in, um, uh, in a very important case. Plus, there are numerous justifications for why price fixing isn't price fixing and why it's justifiable or it it's, uh, doesn't reflect any sort of abusive or anti-competitive behavior. So we're talking some really big challenges, some, some uphills. So let's get back to the tacit agreements because for the most part, from what I can tell in, in, in dealing with the packers, these are not explicit overt agreements to lower prices for fed cattle. These are more tacit agreements that would be harder to prove. So what do we look for? We look for all of the factors that we know make markets less conducive to competitive outcomes. High concentration uh, on the buy side, lots of smaller independent sellers, producers on the sell side, uh, big barriers to entry, right? And vertical integration um, by the packers, <clears throat> which puts them squarely into, into the business of owning animals, but also uh, slaughtering animals, right? So we also have plus factors that pop up in these collusion cases. Plus factors are anything that kind of adds or supports a claim of price fixing, even though you may not have smoking gun evidence, like tapes, videos, or, or emails, right? So things like, um, um, things like uh, motive. Did, did, did a, 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 a market participant, a packer, have a motive to enter into a price fixing agreement? so as to keep prices high and increase profits. Um, is there evidence that the, uh, the, 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 the packer uh, did something that was contrary to uh, their own interest 
because they could have made profits, more profits by engaging in a price fixing uh, conspiracy. So <clears throat> all I'm trying to show you here is that it's difficult. It's difficult to show tacit collusion. We've had many, many numbers of cases, you know, especially in food and ag, which have fallen apart because courts have refused to accept uh, structural factors or what we call the plus factors, okay? So here's the bad law. It was the Valspar case. Valspar versus uh, DuPont and other manufacturers of titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide goes into paint. So Valspar is a paint manufacturer. They needed the titanium dioxide. It was an input. So they sued, uh, uh, they filed suit against uh, DuPont and others for price fixing. So uh, you know, it was just terrible all around. The, por the court appeared to heighten the standard for showing price fixing higher than it's been in the past, which is really high in the first place. Uh, the court concluded that a bunch of really good evidence did not uh, raise a reasonable inference of a conspiracy, stuff like parallel price increases. So DuPont and others would engage in parallel price increasing. They would, they would all uh, charge the same price. It would go up and then it would come down and then it would go up and then it would come down. The court rejected that. They said, oh, that's not, you know, that's not a, an issue for us. Um, the court rejected that the market was conducive to price fixing because there were only a few manufacturers, you know, high concentration in titanium dioxide, uh, and that all the rivals would meet each other at trade association meetings, which makes it much easier for them to exchange information on price and output and marketing and advertising and all that kind of thing. All right? Um, and so, so it was a disaster, <laughs> this Val, Val, Valspar case. We're worried about it from our perspective because it makes it harder now for other price fixing claims uh, that are not explicit claims where there was an explicit agreement. Uh, it makes it harder to, uh, to bring these cases and to prevail, for plaintiffs to prevail in these cases. All right, so what are the arguments against price fixing? You know, what, what, what excuses can defendants use to get off the hook on a price fixing claim? Well, you know, under Packers and Stockyards, you, it's not, if you're not showing harm to competition versus harm to a competitor, you're done. That's, that's your, the, your case is over. Uh, the laws are designed to protect competition, not individual competitors, right? So that's one possible, you know, justification for getting off. Um, some efficiencies justify types of pricing or marketing arrangements to ensure a reliable supply to match, uh, better match supply and demand, to uh, lower transactions costs. These are all considered by some courts as legitimate justifications for engaging in what appears to be collusive pricing, right? And courts have accepted these arguments over and over and over again. And then of course you can always come in and say, well, packers can come in and say, well, you know, um, uh, you know, we have larger scale operations now and um, we still have some excess capacity and that makes pricing more volatile. So if you see price volatility, you can't necessarily blame it on periods of collusive pricing which then break down and then are reestablished. So there are all these reasons that create this really enormous uphill battle to get through a price fixing case. Why do we need to keep pushing on price fixing and not give up on it? because I frankly believe it's there and it happens and it's abusive and it's harmful to producers and to consumers. We have historical data that shows periods of, of oligopsony pricing uh, in, in packing. Uh, pricing and contracting is now really getting very complex. You know more about this than I do for sure. Different pricing methods, different contracting methods. You know, whenever you've got complexity in pricing, and you've got sort of uh, what we call algorithmic pricing where, where formulas change and things adjust quickly and prices can, can really, really move quickly, you're opening up possible opportunities for collusion, right? Because firms can respond very quickly to one another. It's hard to detect. And by having all of this pricing out there uh, with the input variables furnished by, uh, by packers, um, you, can, you can actually create uh, the conditions for an agreement without the firms actually having to agree with one another. They just follow each other because all this information is very transparent and they know what's going on. 
So all of this sort of complex pricing is something to keep an eye on. We're seeing it with the, you know, with online, with internet stuff, with online pricing where uh, like Amazon constantly engages in, uh, in uh, what we call algorithmic pricing, really rapid, rapid changes in pricing. All right, and of course there are still new claims of price fixing coming in. Uh, it's the AgriStats pork integrator litigation. Keep your eye on that. Um, that basically alleges that in sharing information on prices and making these reports available, uh, AgriStats reports available only to industry participants, that created uh, a venue uh, in which firms could see what, the other, what their rivals were doing and then to reach a form of, an, a form of agreement. All right, well, I, I threw this in just because, and you already know this, you know how the pricing methods have changed over time. All right, let's finish up with foreign ownership. Um, why we need to care about foreign ownership, specifically uh, foreign transactions, takeovers, acquisitions of US companies. This is becoming more and more prevalent. As you know, we've had a bunch of cases uh, recently, which we'll see in just a moment. Um, there's just so much, so I, I get this question all the time. Well, if ChemChina wants to take over Syngenta, or if um, the Chinese pork company, which I can't pronounce the name of, wants to take over Smithfield, then why don't the antitrust laws stop this? Why don't they shut it down? And there's a really good answer for that, and that is that under Section 7 of the Clayton Act, uh, that only applies and only triggers when you've got companies that are currently or potentially competing. You don't have to be in the market. You could, you could be entering the market uh, pretty, pretty soon. Uh, they only apply when you've got a potential or a current competitor uh, in a relevant, what we call a relevant product market or a geographic market, right? So if you have a foreign entity that does zero business in the US, no business in the US, even in a vertical supply chain, they could be stuck up there as an input supplier and, and, um, uh, uh, and the agencies will look at all those connections. Where does the foreign company fit in the supply chain? Is there any way for those products or services to hit markets in which US consumers would be affected? If the answer to that is no, Section 7 of the Clayton Act is not gonna help on a, on a review of a transaction like that. But that doesn't mean that these transactions do not still have competitive implications for the US. So what is the background on CFIUS? CFIUS is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, uh, and CFIUS implements, it's a multi-executive agency uh, task force, it implements the Foreign Investment and Security Act. All right, and these reviews are becoming quite public. We see a lot about them in the, in the news. Uh, reviews trigger when you have a transaction that threatens to affect national security, right? Uh, and that's sort of where it stopped as of about five or six years ago. Uh, now we've got uh, more concern about transactions when a foreign government controlled transaction is affecting US commerce. So this would have been ChemChina taking over Syngenta. ChemChina is effectively a Chinese owned, state owned entity. That's a foreign government controlled entity buying uh, a company that does business in the US. Or if it results in, foreign control, results in foreign control of critical infrastructure in the United States. All right, so now the national security component of this has been expanded recently to uh, include multi-sector and a multi-industry focus. Recent reviews, Qualcomm, Broadcom, those are chips, right? That merger didn't go anywhere. That was a big CFIUS review. Smithfield uh, and is it Shuang Hui? Uh, the Chinese uh, pork company, that got CFIUS review. Syngenta Chem China on ag biotech, that got CFIUS review. And you know, Sprint T-Mobile will also get CFIUS review, why? Because Sprint is owned by um, SoftBank, which is a Japanese bank, and um, uh, uh, T-Mobile is owned by, by Deutsche Telekom, which is a German company, right? So we're not just talking about you know, cell towers and <laughs> and things being located near naval bases and, and potentially interfering with uh, US national security. We're talking about uh, those industries, but also food, because the food supply chain is really important, and the safety and stability and security of that supply chain, I, I argue, is a national security issue, absolutely. The health and the well-being of the population is a national security issue. So bottom line, we got a lot of people in Congress 
agitating for CFIUS reviews uh, across a much broader swath of companies. So how does this work? The, what are the mechanics of foreign ownership? Well, basically, you have got a, um, an acquisition of a U.S. Competitor, competitor by a foreign entity that would give that foreign entity control over the decision-making of the U.S. company, right? And with that, that control, say you've got 51% voting, right, uh, voting rights from the, for the foreign entity, along with that would come certain directives to pursue, pursue strategies or policies that are driven not by the U.S. company and the interests of the U.S. company and the U.S. markets, but by the interests of the foreign entity and the markets they're competing in and their agents and their constituents, right? So there's already a clear break. So these strategies can really benefit the foreign entity, entrench their, um, uh, their foreign and global market positions, right? and harm U.S. competition and producers and consumers. So that's why we care about foreign ownership. So what are the strategies that, that foreign owners could implement uh, if they take over a U.S. company, particularly of an agricultural company or a food company? Well, <clears throat> and you heard Bill talk about this earlier, you can have this huge tr uh, technology transfer away from the U.S. company and to the foreign company and that could potentially hurt U.S. consumers. Uh, they could change the direction of innovation in the company away from what would benefit U.S. markets and consumers and producers and towards what benefits um, uh, the foreign owner's constituents. Uh, they could impose lower product quality standards on the U.S. company. This is a big one, right? This was exactly what was, uh, what was of concern in the Smithfield transaction, that there would be lower product quality standards uh, and that would affect competition in the U.S. markets. Uh, foreign company strategies can include foreclosing U.S. rivals from access to technology, inputs, distribution, all to entrench or enhance their market position outside the United States, right? Or they could even try and facilitate collusion amongst U.S. companies, allocate markets or engage in group boycotts to limit competition from U.S. firms in a way that would advantage them. Our argument as an institution is that all of these competitive strategies are highly relevant, highly suspect, and should be looked at in a CFIUS review when, the, when, Clay, when Section 7 of the Clayton Act does not apply. All right, so let's finish up. What are the, what are the priorities for antitrust? Like, this is a, a bit of a depressing story. I've been doing advocacy for 18 years. I'll probably die doing advocacy. I think it's really important. So let's figure out ways to engage, um, you know, to advocate, to, to agitate, uh, to protect and promote fair competition and, uh, and the benefit and the well-being of producers and consumers. So one thing on the antitrust side is to continue to, to vigorously oppose Packer integration into livestock. These vertical relationships between any two firms, you know, where you've got an input and an output or an input and a distribution system. Think AT&T, Time Warner, you have content and distribution. Think CVS, Aetna, where you have pharmacy benefit management with a health insurer. Those types of vertical integrations create really powerfully anti-competitive incentives when you have highly concentrated markets to exclude smaller producers and smaller rivals. We've seen it happen time and time again. And it raises entry barriers to smaller producers, more innovative producers. We should be highlighting um, not only price effects of mergers on the buy side and on the sell side. If on the buy side, prices would be lower. They would be depressed on the sell side, market power, higher prices. But we should also be highlighting the non-price effects of mergers, lower quality, We've seen this happen in uh, hospital mergers, for example, lower, higher mortality rates. We should be absolutely emphasizing the fact that mergers can reduce quality. And that would be really relevant for you all who are producing high quality, high quality products, right? That a, a merger of packers could absolutely force down quality in the markets. And we should oppose any further consolidation really anywhere in the supply chain, at the packing, the processing, and even at the retail level. It's all that consolidation at the retail level, at the grocery uh, level, that forces, that changes incentives 
or it increases incentives for processors to get bigger so they can be bulking up and dealing more effectively with retail grocers, and for processors to bulk up to deal more, uh, more effectively, bargain more effectively with the next guy up in the supply chain. So you should care about the whole supply chain and oppose further consolidation in the whole supply chain. The supply chain looks like an hourglass. A lot of producers, lots of eaters, consumers, and, and just a few firms in the middle part of the supply chain. And that supply chain has gotten that way because of very lax antitrust enforcement in the US. Regulatory reform. You know, somebody really needs to look really hard at all the pricing methods in, in, um, in fed cattle. There are a lot of pricing methods. There are lots of requirements and reporting requirements and transparency. And, it, you know, somebody needs to do a study to, to sort of finance a study to unpack all of that, all of those different pricing methods with the, the goal of figuring out where in the contracting and in the pricing systems that are in place are there opportunities for tacit collusion? Because I guarantee you are there. I haven't done the study. I would love to do the study. But somebody needs to do that. Pricing has become more complex. It's more diverse. Uh, contracting has also become more complex and diverse. But there are, there are some very pro-competitive effects of that, but also some, you know, there's, there's stuff lurking in there that might facilitate uh, collusion. And certainly captive supply reform <coughs> is always an issue on the table. And then finally, uh, priorities for optics and public relations, very important. Continue, from your perspective, continue the pressure to publicize monopsony conditions in the cattle packing markets. You must do this. You must continue to beat the drum on why high concentration is harmful, harmful to you as independent producers, but ultimately harmful to the competitive process and to the consumers of your products, the final consumers of your products, especially on a regional market basis, because uh, that's where the evidence is, is in the regional markets for, uh, for abusive uh, buyer market power. Um, you, if I were you and strategizing, I would absolutely be <coughs> heralding the importance of price competition, but also non-price competition. Uh, one thing about the US is you get a lot of really high quality products out of the US, right? And uh, this is a threat from a lot of the foreign takeover propositions that we've seen. But people care about quality. They do. They absolutely care about quality, especially when it comes to their food. And uh, you know, I'm actually starting a study to look at whether consolidation in food and ag has actually resulted in higher levels of uh, foodborne illness, right? So I'm looking at CDC data to see if uh, we can sort of connect the dots on whether higher levels of consolidation actually results in, 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 in um, worse oversight of, of the food safety process. So absolutely um, advertise the importance of non-price competition. And then um, push your Congress people to demand <laughs> reviews, CFIUS reviews, for any food and agricultural deals and with a focus on the technology transfer issues and the, uh, the quality issues uh, and, and their effects on US producers. And that's what I have uh, for you so far. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. CFIUS? Yeah, so the committee, um, it was actually put into place in 1975 under the Ford administration. Um, there's been some tweaks to it over the, over, you know, the last few years, most recently in 2007, which actually gave the committee some teeth and some, you know, some status. Um, and there are participants on that committee from a variety of different executive agencies. Chuck Grassley from Iowa uh, has a bill, I believe, uh, still in committee, uh, which would put USDA on, CIFI on the CFIUS committee, right? Uh, they do short, sort of quick turnaround reviews. I think they're like 30-day reviews. They're, they do not release the results of their reports. Unhelpful. Um, it would be nice if they did. But for example, the Department of Justice is involved in those, in those reviews. Uh, but they happen really fast. And we don't, all we get is an answer, yay or nay, up or down and we don't get any, any information on the content of those reports. 
which I think is a really um, un, you know, unhelpful thing. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. The U.S. government knows that the government of China is behind uh, the purchase of Cisco over 10 Why did they stop it? Good question. Very good question. There was a CFIUS review, right? Uh, I don't think there was an antitrust review. Can somebody check me on that? No antitrust review. Um, I think they didn't stop it because these issues that we've been talking about are frontier issues and, um, and, and uh, CFIUS and the DOJ and the FTC and the USD, USDA are not thinking about the connections between foreign takeovers and, and adverse effects on US, on US markets, producers, competition, and consumers. They're just not, they're just not thinking about it yet. They haven't connected the dots that I, you know, I, try, I put out here a few slides ago on how foreign takeovers can actually materially affect competition in the U.S. And it's our job as advocates to, to keep pushing this and to keep educating. So on, on ChemChina Syngenta, I did a lot of work with Chuck Grassley's office to explain to them what these, what these concerns were and why the CFIUS Review Committee should be, should be taking this stuff seriously. So, you know, it's a bad answer, I know. It's not a, it's not a, a satisfying answer. Other questions, comments? So let me just, I know I'm out of time, but let me just say, uh, we're an advocacy organization. We do research, education, and advocacy. Um, we do our jobs better when we can talk to you all and when we understand your businesses, we understand your markets, your incentives, we hear stories about abusive behavior. We can then take that stuff and we can work with it, and we can talk to Congress, and we can talk to the enforcement agencies, and that allows us to be better proponents and advocates for, for competition. Thank you very much.